One minute. and welcome to day three of TechFest brought to you by ITA Cork and Skillnet. I'm coming to you live from the very impressive Fee studio in the Northlink Business Park on the Old Mallow Road, which is a state-of-the-art virtual studio. The theme of today is the future of education, and this is unique within the TechFest agenda because it was voted by you as being a topic of particular interest. And we can see why that is. This is very timely, COVID-19 has resulted in prolonged school closures and massive disruption to the educational sector worldwide. The consequence of this is that we have seen a rapid shift, an unplanned shift, in how we educate our students. And of course, technology is at the heart of that. So online learning, blended learning, earn as you learn, all these modes of education that we've become commonly familiar with. And of course, they existed prior to the, the pandemic but they've now become commonplace and they've been expedited. So this raises many questions about the future of education. What will it look like? What should it look like? And will technology help or hinder student learning? So one of those questions would be whether this radical shift in the education sector will be permanent. Whether when teaching via technology, the quality and the student experience that we've traditionally been accustomed to can be maintained and whether online, albeit offering flexibility, will result in a loss of learning for certain student cohorts and perhaps maybe exacerbate inequalities. So it's against this backdrop that this track is going to debate and examine those issues relating to the future of education. And we really look forward to hearing the opinions of our expert panel and our thought leaders. So on that note, I would encourage you to sit back, enjoy the day, and I'll hand you over to our MC for today, Jonathan Healy, and our platform providers, Trend Micro. device decides to die.
lots to discuss. This particular track is on education and we're going to be talking about education technology, how it has changed so much over the course of the last couple of months and whether that change is indeed going to be permanent going forward. Now this particular track was chosen by you. So uh, thank you very much to everybody who decided on what the topic was going to be today and how interesting that was going to be. So TechFest of course is brought to you by IT at Cork and IT at Cork's lear learning partner IT at Cork Skillnet. We are once again broadcasting uh, from Tech Trend Micro uh, in Cork. Very big thank you to them for giving us a lend of the hall and uh, using their, their green screen, where, uh, which is a, a great old trick to, to show you something more interesting behind you than a blank wall. Um, if you want to find out more about what's happening across the course this week, we've got techsummit.ie as the website address. Uh, the way it works will be similar to how it worked for the last two days. We're going to have a very interesting and lively discussion in the morning, followed uh, by a workshop in the afternoon. And today's workshop is with thanks to the IMI, and we're going to be discussing leadership and resilience a little bit later on. A big hello to uh, students who are tuning in this morning as well because they were invited to take part in this because let's face it they're the ones who are going to be the end users of this particular product and uh, probably going to help build a better one in the future when we will all be their subjects and masters and they'll be our bosses and we will be very grateful uh, to everything that they give us. If you're tweeting or posting on social media this morning the hashtag as you can see behind me is hashtag tech cork 20. So if you're posting anything, please do use the opportunity to use that hashtag and let's see if we can uh, make a little bit of noise outside of the people who are watching this event live this morning. So a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording this session so the people who are going to join us, just be conscious that you will be recorded and it will be made available later on to members uh, of IT Cork and indeed the general public. We're going to be running a series of audience polls as well just to keep you tuned in this morning. So if you uh, uh, can see them, there's the first one. That's your first audience poll. Do you think the technology could have enabled the leaving certificate to be delivered virtually this year. Mildly controversial, let's not mention the fact uh, that some people had their grades downgraded. Um, yes, absolutely, maybe, but it, is but it is complicated, you're telling me, and no, it was never an option. So take part in that right now, give us your honest thoughts, uh, and we will come back to that poll uh, a little bit later on to talk more about that. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about this morning uh, is the Q&A. So if you have a question uh, that you want to put to any of our panelists this morning, please feel free to do so. You can use the Q&A that's at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Those questions will come on to the big screen just inside my camera here, and I will put them uh, to our speakers. And uh, we have an interesting lineup of speakers. In a minute, we're going to talk to David Whelan of VR Education, and then we have representatives from UCC, CIT, and Mary I, who are going to be talking about the future of technology in educational setting. So please, I do need your questions this morning because I really am not the expert here. Um, we've got the experts on the panel and you guys are our experts for the morning because you're the users, you're the people who are going to be putting this into practice in the years ahead. So do get the questions in, challenge our panelists. They love a good hard question. So please feel free to send them in. So online, blended, earn as you learn, where is this all going to end up? Educational institutes are reopening now after months of being closed and parents and teachers and educators are all collectively holding their breath to see if the efforts that have gone in over the last few months will pay off and students can remain in education, preferably in classroom, but at a push virtually in a better way than we had before. We wonder if the speed of change though, immeasurably accelerated by the pandemic is going to result in permanent changes to how we do things or are we going to revert back to type, back to the more traditional, basically pen and paper model uh, that existed once the vaccine is found? We have come to understand the far reaching economic and societal consequences of school closures and college closures in terms of our ability to work productively. And we've actually a newfound admiration for educators, the work that they put in, the tolerance that they have and their ability to respond to crises as they arise. They are now effectively frontline workers and given an acknowledgement that for years perhaps was put past them. So the questions we are asking today, will there be a new emphasis on apprenticeships and on the job learning? Will the student experience be inspiring and engaging? Can technology fill the gaps or will we all just get bored of staring at screens that aren't showing us Fortnite? 
all of these questions we're going to try and answer over the course of the next few hours. And this track will examine and debate the future of education from many important perspectives. We have lots to get through this morning, but I want to bring in our first guest who's going to give us our keynote presentation. First of all, let's uh, see if the screen works, uh, given that we're talking about technology. David Whelan of VR Education. Good morning, David. How are you? Morning, Jonathan. Very good. I'm good. Now, yes, we can see you. Well, that, isn't that a great bonus to begin the day with? Um, first of all, before we get into your presentation, David, how have the last few months been for you? COVID-19 has really has been a game changer in our business. We've been so, so busy. Uh, people are looking for alternatives to uh, Zoom conferencing and using Zoom for education, whereas the product that I will be talking about, we have a virtual classroom where it really feels like you're inside a real class. So it's been a certain game changer for our business going forward. And actually, we've grown our um, staff numbers by 25% over the past three months, which is something which is very unusual in this uh, current climate. So it, it, it's had a positive effect on us. I would have liked it in some other way, but look, we'll, we'll take it. No, never waste a good opportunity, as they say. And there is a demand out there. I know from my own first foray into Google Classroom in the last few weeks, Jenny MacCougall could have tried a bit harder with it. But you know what? It's better than what we had before, which was nothing. Look, we're going to let you uh, get on with your presentation. But again, folks, uh, those of you who are watching uh, at home, um, whether you're in your pyjamas, whether you're in the office or whatever you're doing, please do tweet uh, or post using the hashtag TechCork20. And if you have a question for David, use the Q&A session below us here because that is the best way that you're going to be able to get in contact. And I will put those questions uh, to David in just a few minutes' time. But for now, David Whelan, it's over to you. Thanks very much. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Um, hopefully you can see that. Um, give it a, okay. So I'm just going to make a full screen. Uh, duplicate slideshow. So I'm the CEO of VR Education. We are a Waterford-based company and uh, we're very well known for two different um, areas. So the first area of our business is we build showcase edu edutainment experiences and these are kind of like education video games and we've built projects in the past in virtual reality. Um, the first one we built was Apollo 11 VR, which became a global bestseller. The student becomes Neil Armstrong, gets to walk on the moon and plant the flag. We've also built Titanic VR, where you explore the full shipwreck of the Titanic in your own submarine and you also witness the sinking of Titanic from the point of view of a survivor on Lifeboat 6. And this year we're releasing Shuttle Commander, but really the mainstay of the business is our engaged platform which is a virtual reality education and corporate training tool where any educator or trainer can teach any subjects to anybody else in the world in a virtual environment and the way it works is when you log into the engaged platform there's a virtual version of you inside a virtual classroom and you can do everything that you can do in the real world you can do in the virtual world. So you can stand up and you can draw on our virtual whiteboard. You can um, bring in PowerPoint presentations. You can stream in media. But because it is virtual reality, you can do a lot of specialized things. You can bring in 3D objects. Here you can actually see an example of people walking on the surface of Mars next to the Curiosity rover. It's a very, very intuitive and um, easy way to, to get students and kids excited about education really what we're trying to bring is emotion back into education get people really engaged with the content the company itself is uh, five years old again we are based in waterford we were the first tech company in 17 years to list on the irish um, stock exchange we have a, a staff of um, 50 and we're working with really large institutions worldwide we're actually working with oxford university working with Stanford University. We're also working with the US Air Force Academy and um, providing uh, services. But before I get to the Engage platform, maybe a little bit of a, a background about virtual reality in education. So a lot of people think that virtual reality is a new technology, whereas in fact, it's a very mature technology. It's been used for over 40 years, but it's been hugely expensive. And that's why high-end institutions have only and used it because it was it was so expensive. So NASA were using virtual reality to train their astronauts. They've been using it for over 30 years. The US military have been using um, virtual reality as well for combat training and very high-end medical training institutions have been using virtual reality for many, many years. Now, they wouldn't use virtual reality for such a long period if they didn't get proven results. But again, these headsets were very expensive. The NASA one you can see there, for an example, cost about 200,000 euros, and then the computer to run it would have cost uh, the equivalent 
but now it's becoming very, very affordable and affordable for the general, um, general public. Here we can see this is a, a rundown of when a mining company in South Africa used virtual reality for training and for safety training and they discovered that nearly all their workforce preferred the virtual training than the traditional role play training that they would have received and when they introduced virtual reality into their training it reduced workplace accidents by up to 43 percent within a six month period so it was very very effective almost immediately and within virtual reality virtual reality has a very high retention rate for knowledge so people learn by doing it's like riding a bike you can read as much as you like about riding a bike but once you sit on a bike and learn how to ride that bike that's when you remember and virtual reality has the same kind of experiential learning and in some cases there's an 80 percent better retention rate using a virtual method than maybe a traditional uh, paper and pen uh, based medic me method for learning and here we can actually see um, some test results. So there was A-B testing um, uh, completed in a class and they taught, um, say, a traditional method to half the class and a non-traditional method using virtual reality to uh, the other half of the class. And when they completed the test, um, they discovered that the, the students who were using virtual reality for their training, they had a 27% test score. But quite often when you introduce new technology into testing, because it's new and novel, people will be uh, more attentive and they will get a better test result immediately after the test. However, they done a delayed test a few weeks later and they actually discovered that the retention level for those people who use the virtual method, they had a 32% better test score when they had the delayed uh, test a few weeks later. So a little bit more in depth about the Engage platform. So the Engage platform allows again any educator to teach any subject in a virtual room or a, a virtual location and these locations can be anywhere they can be a classroom if need be but if you're talking about marine biology as an example why not teach that on the seabed and have a whale swim through the center of the class that's all available within the platform you can have up to 70 people connected remotely from all over the world in the same virtual classroom and each person is represented by a digital person a digital avatar and when you're wearing the, the VR headset, it feels like you're in a real room. You can actually stand up and shake hands with somebody. There's a 3D spatial audio as well, which is very, very well relevant, where as I'm giving this presentation right now, everybody is attentive to myself. They can see my head and they can see my PowerPoint presentation. But if you are in a classroom environment with 30 or 40 students, and quite often you're using uh, Zoom or video-based communications, a lot of the students will be on mute. A lot of the students will have their cameras uh, switched off. You don't really know, are they um, attentive? Are they listening to you? Whereas in a classroom, when you're in a real physical classroom, you can look at the students. You can see if students are yawning. You can see if students are, are sleeping at their desk. You can do the very same in virtual reality because as people move within virtual reality, their real world movements are actually translated onto their avatar. So if somebody is yawning, you can see that on their avatar. If somebody's asleep, slouched over the desk, you can also see that on the avatar. But because we have 3D audio, the students themselves can lean over and talk to each other without disturbing the rest of the classroom. And it's been used very extensively or engaged platform for events at the moment where you can have hallway conversations where on video based platforms that just simply can't happen. You can also have interactive objects. So you can bring in a 3D model and um, so you, you could bring in say an aircraft engine as an example and um, set four or five uh, maintenance um, students over on a task and say okay you need to rebuild that engine and that can all be done in virtual reality at, at a very very uh, low cost. There's also a web application so we've made it very uh, familiar to um, people who use Zoom and uh, video based communications where they can schedule classes and meetings using the web app. They can connect uh, their cloud sharing services so they can share documents from uh, OneDrive, Google Docs uh, or any web media. They can stream in video from YouTube and Vimeo but because it, again it is virtual reality you can stream in 360 video um, which is a fully immersive wraparound video. Now the example that I'm going to show here this is um, Oxford University. So about two years ago before COVID-19 um, broke out we were working with Oxford University and we created a series of lectures inside the Engage platform and it was very easy and intuitive to do. So what we're doing with Engage is yes you can present live and you can stand and present as you would in, in a real classroom and you can do your PowerPoint presentation but there's a recording feature 
inside Engage, where when you click on record, it records everything that you do and say. It'll also record all your physical movement on your avatar, and it will record any objects that you bring in the environment. So in this case, this professor at Oxford University, um, he was giving a, a lecture, and we put it in a virtual Bodleian library, which is a very famous location in Oxford University. And as he was speaking, Engage was recording everything that he was doing and saying, and it records his presentation, and there's the presentation in behind him. So as he gave his presentation, um, what we were saying to the educator, to the professor is, and here you see some of the 3D objects coming in, we were saying to the professor, if you make any mistakes, if you cough, if you splutter, if you make any mistakes at all, leave it in because that gives a sense of presence that the person is really in there with you. And then he could, he could, as soon as he gave his presentation, stand back and replay his presentation again. And if he, he was happy with his performance, he could publish that on the platform. So it's very easy to, to quickly create content, whereas on a lot of online education, especially in MOOC platforms, which are massive online open course systems, what happens is you get served a video which is very overproduced. There's a certain disconnect where you know you're watching a video. It's so perfect, this person doesn't make any mistakes. mistakes you don't feel that this person is real, whereas when you're in a virtual environment where people make mistakes, if they scratch their head, if they stutter over a word, you really get a sense that that person is in a room with you. And that's something that's uh, quite unique to virtual platforms. And here you can actually see with this immersive lecture, it can really be spiced up, where as he's talking about um, protons actually hitting uh, cancer cells, he's giving a representation of here's, a, here's what the, the proton looks like. If it hits a wall, it will destroy the wall. So there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with, within the Engage platform and you don't need any animation skills or you don't need any pro programming skills. So another example here, this is a medical training um, with Oxford University. I'll just skip through it here. So there's a group within Oxford University called the Life Project. And what they do is, or what they used to do, is they used to teach um, how students how to resus babies with very limited equipment in uh, African hospitals. So not uh, there's quite a lot of hospitals in Africa that wouldn't have the latest equipment, and quite quite a lot of babies would actually die during childbirth. So a group of professors in Oxford University, a group of educators, would hop on a plane quite regularly and fly over to Africa with a with a like a, a baby doll a very lifelike baby doll and equipment. And then they would go into a physical room uh, with about 20 students and each one of the students would practice on the doll a couple of times about the procedure on how to resource a baby. But what they found is that when you're in a group of uh, a group of 20 students and they're, they're practicing on a doll, quite often they wouldn't take it very seriously because there's a lot of kind of peer pressure around them. But we rebuilt this full um, uh, scenario inside virtual reality. And as you can see, there's a virtual baby. You have four minutes to save the baby and the baby is getting bluer and bluer. Um, and it reacts in real time as well. So the baby would react very much like a real baby. And then when you actually do eventually save the baby, you'll see the baby, the baby wakes up and starts crying. It really induces a lot of stress in the students when they're inside because they're by themselves, they're on their own. They need to uh, save this baby. and they really retain a lot from this, but not only is um, this just on the headset, but the professors themselves can actually log in remotely. So the professors actually stay in uh, Oxford now and they teach this um, on a monthly basis. And there's VR equipment actually located over in Africa in some of the training centers where they bring in students and they learn the procedure on how to do this. Whereas before they would, the, the professors would only went over maybe two or three times a year. So they're actually getting more and more students through these simulators and it's having a, a huge uh, benefit um, for people over there. There you can see actually I'm, I'm uh, trying to resource the baby. You can see in my hands actually there's nothing in my hands only these VR controllers but for in my mind I'm actually trying to um, resource the baby with the breathing apparatus. So here's another example of what, what could be done within virtual reality. So this is safety training um, on, on a, an oil rig. So again, hugely expensive to provide uh, training like this for say oil companies where they would fly um, workers over on a helicopter over to a platform and they would uh, provide the training. Now let's just get through a little bit. Whereas in virtual reality, it can all be done again at very low cost, but it can also be done very um, realistically as well. So you can set fires inside locations and you can, you can do different types of scenarios as well. All of this stuff is very easy and very easy and intuitive to create. 
And the thing is, when, when you're standing in virtual reality, um, and it's, say if you're underwater, it will feel like you're underwater. If you're afraid of heights and we put you at a height, it will feel like you're afraid of heights. And back to the education setting as well, when we um, built the Apollo 11 experience, we reused all the real audio from the event itself. Everything that we created um, when you're sitting in the cockpit, all of that looks very, very real, very, very accurate. And it was a 45 minute journey. And really what we're trying to do is inspire um, kids and inspire students into, into education, not just reading um, in a textbook and, and looking at images. This way you can just, you can feel the emotion of the events itself. So on the engaged platform, and because of COVID-19, um, we've seen a huge increase in demand um, for the platform. And one of the, the um, uses for the platform has been virtual events. So again, even though Engage was primarily designed as an education, education and training uh, platform, there was a lot of um, areas where it could be used very, very uh, easily. And one of the, the areas has been um, events, because obviously a lot of events have been canceled. And we had an event with HTC, um, in China back in March where we had over 1,600 people logged in. We had keynote speakers from all over the world and we had 1.1 million people watching uh, the live stream. And um, the reason we could do this is we have a system called Projected Presence which we built for education where, where if you want to teach a million people all at the same time, instead of giving them a video, you want to feel like that they're you want to feel like you're within touch and distance of that person. So what we can do is you can teach live within the platform and we can put in a, a stock avatar in front of you. So like a stock virtual person and you can present to that person as if the person was in the room with you. But in reality, what we're doing is we're actually cloning your digital person, your digital avatar into a million different rooms and those million people are all watching you. So they all feel like they're getting a one-to-one -one talk from, um, from you, whereas in fact, you're actually teaching a million people. And we call that system uh, projected presence. And even though the avatars don't look 100% realistic, here you can see um, someone presenting at a round table discussion, they look realistic enough, but because they move in a very natural way, because they're being tracked with the virtual reality equipments, you really get a sense of presence of that person. And um, one of the things that I really want to uh, outline here and where I see the future of education is we are very lucky um, that we live in Ireland. Like Ireland is a fantastic country, especially for education. Sometimes you wouldn't feel that with uh, maybe some of the negative things that you might see in press sometimes, but we deal a lot with um, um, people in the United Kingdom and also in America. And in those countries, if you wanted to provide your, your, um, your kids with a good third level education, especially in America, you're looking at a six figure sum, it's sometimes $250,000, $300,000 student debt is what you would have after a two or three year education. Now in Ireland, if you do your Lehman Cert and you get good results, your education is pretty much paid for um, by the government. Yes, they are some small fees, but they're not massive um, in any way. So if you want to go to university or college, you have the opportunity to do that in Ireland. But in many countries, um, that doesn't happen. And really what we're trying to get with Engage is that I fully believe there's very smart people out there in the world who've never had the opportunity. People who are as smart as Einstein, they're probably in Burger King somewhere flipping burgers because they've never had the opportunity to get that education. And we're, we're really trying to open up education globally where for a fraction of the cost, you can attend a virtual university and um, say you can go to virtual Oxford University or a virtual Stanford University at a fraction of the cost and you can, you can tailor your educators. Myself and my education, um, I'm dyslexic. I'm, I'm really good at some subjects, but I'm very poor at other subjects. I never had the opportunity to go to university because I, I didn't get the, the grades. And it wasn't because my educators were poor um, by no means. It's just I responded better to some of my educators than others. And those educators that I responded well to who are very visual uh, uh, teachers, I'm very good in those subjects. And really where I want to get to in the future is that you can tailor your education. So I see in the future where as a student, you can sit down, put on a VR headset, attend a virtual classroom, and then you can pick and choose your educators. So you could do physics in MIT in the morning. You could do English literature in Oxford University in the afternoon afternoon. So you're tailoring your education to your needs. And I do see that even educators themselves will become very specialized because you know the educators who are very passionate about their subjects. They're the really fantastic educators. And even say, as an example, a, a, a history teacher, they might be an expert in say Irish history, 
but they mightn't be such an expert in World War II history. So I see that educators themselves will also start evolving where you will see educators who specialize in certain subjects and they'll be the educators that students will go to if they have to get through um, a certain curriculum that they will, um, they will tailor their, their educators to the experts in those fields. And I, th I think that's coming very, very soon. Um, so again, we have been holding a lot of events lately inside Engage because of COVID-19. So the XPRIZE Foundation actually just held an event um, two days ago. They're very famous for the 10 million prize fund for sending the first, or 10 million prize fund for the first company, non-governmental uh, company to send two people to space and back. But here you can actually see a list of uh, companies and organizations using the Engage platform today. And now remember, we're, we're a very small company in Ireland, but we're getting a lot of traction very recently so um, Stanford University are using the platform the Air Force Academy are using the platform as well Facebook are using the platform for uh, training and events and with Stanford University what's happening is in the United States um, there's a lot of universities that are closed down a lot of people aren't going to universities because of obviously the COVID restrictions Stanford University are using Engage for distance learning where they have people in the virtual classroom and are teaching medical training so are our Arizona University are doing the same as well. And with corporations for training and developments, um, a lot of their workers aren't in offices at the moment. So they're using Engage for their daily stand-up meetings, uh, for their PowerPoints, and also for uh, just making sure that they keep their, their workers connected because there is a lot of isolation with people working from home and a lot of Zoom fatigue. Um, so why VR? So, with virtual reality, it is still quite a niche. There's not a lot of headsets out there at the moment, but that's about to change. Headsets now are becoming very, very um, inexpensive. And these, these charts were actually made before COVID hit. COVID was a real double-edged sword in, ma in many ways. So when COVID hit um, China, most of these headsets are actually produced in China. So production went way, way down. However, demand for the headsets really, really grew and they were like gold dust for three or four months, um, especially the, the Oculus headset and the HTC headsets. People were trying to buy these, but they couldn't, couldn't get them and they were charging like four or five times more than their retail price. However, that's changed now where production is back up. Facebook are just about to release a new headset. It's 300 euros. Um, it's less than the price of an iPad. And for what you get in return, it, it really is... Um, it really is a good investment, I think, for, for any, any parent if you want to get their kids into, into immersive education. And we're seeing more and more um, schools, especially in Asia and in, in America, that are actually uh, creating packages where they're giving the students the headsets and also then logging in and doing virtual classes. Um, also as well, very, very soon, um, these headsets, I believe, are going to become free. Uh, well, not free, but on a subscription model, very similar to mobile phones. A lot of telecom companies are trying to upsell their customers onto 5G accounts, but they're finding that super difficult because by and large, people are very happy with their 4G subscription. They can watch Netflix, they can check their emails. There's no real need to have a gigabit connection on your mobile phone. However, in virtual reality, it makes a massive difference where you can, add, where you can render the graphics on a server somewhere and just send them directly to the headset. So it makes the headset smaller, makes it lighter, it makes it cheaper, it makes it more akin to wearing glasses. And um, so a lot of the telecoms companies are looking very seriously at um, bringing out their own VR headsets. And one of the companies we're working with is Deutsche Telekom in this regard. And um, they're looking to release a headset uh, later this year. So very soon you will walk into telecom shops and you're going to sign up for a, a new account, a 5G account. They're going to give you the very nice brand new, say, 5G enabled phone, but they're also going to give you a VR AR headset um, to, to consume content on that. And one of the the key people coming into this area, we feel very soon, is Apple. Um, they've been buying up uh, VR and AR companies very recently, and they also um, there has been a lot of rumors about a VR AR headset that they're going to be bringing out quite soon. And the thing with Apple is, when Apple announced something to the world, um, and when they bring out a product, it then becomes cool in many people's eyes. I remember when the Apple Watch came out, people were like, why would I need this watch? You walk around now, you see many people wearing um, um, smart watches. The same with their, their phone when the iPhone came out first. People were saying, oh, it's very expensive. Every, a lot of people, or nearly everybody in the world has a smartphone now. VR and AR is just about to get over that cliff edge for mass adoption, and we're going to see that very, very soon. And obviously, Facebook are very heavily invested in this space as well. They said that their target is 1 billion people in VR over the next five years. And when they say something like that, I, I believe them. 
Um, so with Engage, as I said, we were a niche within a niche where it could only be used on um, VR headsets. But very recently, we released Engage on uh, mobile phones. And you can see here, this is my daughter on our mobile phone interacting with uh, a presenter inside the Engage platform. So you can download it on any Android phone or Android tablet, and very similar to be on um, iPhones as well. It's a similar experience to what kids would get when they're playing Fortnite on a phone. So they can move around within the environment. It is very much more immersive than just watching a video. Obviously, we prefer people to have uh, VR headsets, but still, it's a pretty good experience. And here you can see these digital avatars interacting with each other, passing objects, and the presenter there is going, going to bring down, uh, that's a samurai sword, actually. I, I don't know what he was teaching there, to be honest, but if you want more information on it, the, the website link is, is down at the end. But you can see how natural the, the movement is and how intuitive it is. So I think that was, uh, that's just about 20 minutes for me. I'm happy to take any questions from anybody. Um, the contact details for the company are up on the, up on the screen there now. Okay. Okay, Dave, thank you very much. A whole lot to take in there. Um, I, I'm trying and failing not to feel like an old person watching that going, sure, what's the point of doing that now when you can do it in a real room? But the, you, you had me at the end there. I mentioned Fortnite already, that the generation that's coming behind us their expectation is going to be completely different. First of all, um, the question that I'm going to ask first is cost. And you, you referenced this. The headsets for that kind, that, that Oxford experience that you were talking about earlier on, is that beyond the reach of not just education institutions who might be able to buy them in bulk, but your average student who's watching this at home right now? No, it's like for the headset, um, for the full virtual headset, it's 300 euros for the headset. So there's many, many schools, even in Ireland, that went out and bought everybody iPads uh, for their schools and the iPads were six, seven hundred dollars a pop. Um, so it's very, very inexpensive. And then for people to use the platform, we have different packages and they go all the way down to five dollars a month to get access to Engage and you get access to all the features and the educators themselves can um, can create and share their own content. Yeah. But again, very, very soon coming um, as you buy your next mobile phone, you're going to get some of these headsets um, bundled in as a package. Right, and, and that's the next question I was going to ask you. Um, there are, as usual, you, you have the cheap version, but is there a way in which the phone can be converted to a headset? And is that how this is probably going to evolve? There was, um, back Samsung used to have their flagship phones, you'd stick it in like this phone holder and you put it on, but it wasn't a great experience. You really need a dedicated piece of hardware, but like for $300, not, not a huge amount of money um, um, for the device itself, but again, it will become part of, of the subscription. Many of the universities in America, what they do is they'll probably, they buy about maybe two or 300 headsets from us, and then they'll give that to the students um, themselves. So um, yeah, it, it's inexpensive, but it's getting less expensive each time. Okay. It, uh, the question as well, uh, the one thing we've learned is that the in-classroom experience, you just can't beat it. Uh, and, and that is the interpersonal relationship between the teacher and the student. Um, this virtual world, is it going to replace that or is it going to augment it? So in other words, will the traditional setting use VR as part of the traditional experience rather than at all migrate to some kind of weird matrix style education system? It's going to it's going to help it. So I think there's going to be kind of um, two separations of um, education. So there will be the physical locations where people can physically go to a building and um, get an education. But also the way the virtual um, setting will work is that the generation that are that are growing up right now and um, they're the on demand generation. So it's not like when we were growing up, we had RT one and RT two, whatever. We have, to, we have to wait for programs to start, which exactly. seems so antiquated now. Exactly, and, and we were served what we were served in, and we either liked it or we didn't like it. The generation today are used to getting what they want when they want. So uh, Netflix, for an example, they can watch a whole series whenever they want to. They watch whatever TV that they want on YouTube. Everything is served to them instantly. I think education is going to go exactly the same way where from the comfort of their own home, if they want to learn something, they want to learn it from the industry expert. And they can put on a headset and log into a class, say at MIT, for the expert in whatever subject that they want. And then they can log into another classroom and um, from another teacher that they, that, that they really get on with and get that education okay. served directly to them. And I think they'd be very specialized um, teachers doing specialized subjects. Another old fart question. Um, 
having dealt with a lot of companies that, that do crisis planning and crisis scenarios, the helicopter landing on the oil rig, the oil rig fire scenario, yeah. that will train you to a certain degree, but it doesn't train you for what the real world is like. How much is there a concern over, you know, oh, well, it's fine. it worked out fine in VR, but when you came to doing it in real world, it was hard. I mean, think pilots. Pilots and automation in planes hasn't, has made planes safer, but has made pilots less safe because they rely an awful lot on the automation. Is there a worry about that? Uh, no, so it's actually, it's um, the, the, two, the two parts of education are still there. So with the US military, as an example, they do a lot of their flight training in virtual reality. Um, now they do their helicopter training and their actual uh, fighter jet training in virtual reality. They'll probably get about 200 hours of training that way. And then when they go on the real um, machine, instead of spending 50 hours on a real machine to get certified, now they only have to spend 20 hours on the machine because they know it inside out from the virtual training. So it actually reduces the real world cost of the, the physical training. Okay, let's uh, go to some of the questions that have come in here and there's been lots of them. And if you have a question, Q&A at the bottom, use it and uh, send the question in while we still have Dave. Uh, in relation to training uh, that required physical touch, i.e. medical, um, would the introduction of this type of um, haptics increase the learning experience? And has there been any studies that show that this can help? Yeah, so we've worked with the uh, Royal College of Surgeons in Dublin. They were actually one of our very first clients and they've done a study and they've shown that, uh, yes, the retention level in using the, the virtual uh, lesson is, is more than what they would have done with paper-based uh, uh, learning. So the example that I would, would go with is there's a procedure to insert a, a, a chest drain to inflate a, a, a collapsed lung. And it's very procedural. And the way that they normally teach it is that it's paper-based where you have uh, multiple choice questions. You'd fill them all in, you'd give them to the assessor, and then at the end, then you'd get a grade. And there's like a two or three day kind of process before, after you, you get the, the test to see have you done well. In the virtual setting, it's a, it's a 10 minute experience where you put on the headset, you're still doing that procedure, but you're actually in front of the patient and you're choosing what to do and you're getting instant feedback. So doing the virtual way, they can actually do that scenario 10 or 15 times in the same time that it would have taken just one paper okay. based assessment. Um, next question, uh, is it possible to conduct exams through VR? Yeah, so you can do multiple choice um, questionnaires inside if, if that's what you want to do. But the thing with Engage as well is it can record not just the educator, it can also record the students. So if it's something that they physically have to do, like a virtual lab experiment, Engage can record everything that the student does. And then when getting assessed, the teacher can actually stand next to the student and replay what the student has done. And the student themselves can be their best critic and they can say, well, actually, I should have done this, this and this. And they, they learn it a lot better that way than actually hearing somebody criticize them. Okay, next question is from Sean. Good morning to you, Sean. Thanks for sending in your question. Interesting point that students could attend virtual classrooms. Uh, that would include the number of students, e.a. thousands in a course. But this VR scenario also needs the teachers, the lecturers, the tutors. So do you know if the university is using this platform, increasing, teach increasing teachers and especially VR using teachers? So in other words, is this bad news for teachers that there'd be fewer of them? No, this is good news for teachers and students because a platform like this allows them more one-on-one -on -one time with the students individually. So as a teacher, you're probably teaching you are teaching the same subject over and over again quite often and you're probably repeating yourself uh, many, many times to different kids uh, throughout the day. Whereas if you're doing it virtually in a virtual platform, you can record your lecture series and you can say to the students, okay, do lectures one, two and three today. And they will feel like that that's happening live so you're not repeating yourself. And then it'll give you more time. You can't interact though with the avatar, can they? So it, it, it is a kind of a, once you press play, you can't stop it. Not yet, um, but it is coming. So we're working on AI where um, the teacher themselves, if, if the student asks the avatar a question, and this is coming um, um, very, very soon, using voice recognition and AI, if the student asks the question, the, the, the avatar will recognize that. And then if the answer is on the database, the avatar will then serve back the answer to the student. So they will actually think that that, that, um, that teacher is actually live there and that's coming soon. I'm conscious of the fact that uh, you need to hop off, so I'm going to go through two more questions if I can. Uh, one is in from Dario. In terms of accessibility, could VR be good for visually impaired people? 
Yes, uh, because we have spatial audio, so they can hear the world exactly the same as the real world. So if something is behind you, it sounds like they're behind you. If you want to whisper in someone's ear, you can also do that. And actually, we are working with vision impaired people in the United States. Um, it's, it was something that I, I, I didn't expect. It just came totally out of the blue, and they went and they, they purchased like several hundred uh, accounts, and they seem to get a real uh, good kick out of it. Okay, very good. And uh, one last one in from Paddy. Good morning, Paddy. Great product, David. You showcased the educator sector. You showcased oil, gas, medical, military. Is there any other sector out there uh, that to date has not adopted VR education but could see the benefits of it? So where are you targeting? Um, it, it's such an open platform. Uh, really, we're just a tech company and we're providing a platform where educators and trainers can build whatever they want on it. And we get surprised when we come in the morning um, to see what exactly it's been used for in many different areas. The vision impaired one is a perfect example. Again, I never would have thought that it would have been used um, in that way, but I do think it can touch many, many industries. It's not ideal for everything. Sometimes you do need that human touch, but right now, especially in the world that we're living in, and I don't think COVID is going to go anywhere soon, people really need an alternative to video-based platforms. Like I know many teachers are very Zoom fatigued and the students themselves aren't really enjoying it, whereas this all is, of it's Zoom fatigue, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we hold all our, like we have 50 staff here in Waterford and we hold all our daily, daily meetings and our, our stand-ups in the virtual space. And a lot of our, our staff actually are, um, like they're tech people. A lot of these are single males and they were locked in a house for two months. And when we were having these daily stand-ups, we were actually finding it hard to hunt them out because this was really their only interaction with people in a day, you know. So that, that just kind of gives a sense of how immersive it can be. Okay, um, Dave Whelan of uh, VR Education. Absolute pleasure for, to talk to you, to hear about it. We wish you the very best. Look, as the technology evolves, we're heading towards the, the holodeck in Star Trek and uh, you're the closest I've seen to it so far. But Dave, thanks very much for joining us this morning from Waterford. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye. Hashtag TechCork20 is uh, the hashtag if you're using social media. There's a lot to take in there. Um, and I'd be intrigued to get the opinion of all the people who are watching right now. Is that going to work? Is it going to make a difference? Is this, is this kind of the 64-bit version of what will eventually become a PC? Or, or is this really going to help education moving forward? Has COVID shown us the light or has COVID shown us the risk? We're going to talk about that in great detail now with our panel, who I would like to turn on their cameras and their microphones now so we can see and hear them for the first time on this session. Don't forget Q&A, use it at the bottom, get the questions in nice and early so we can put them to the panel before we finish up. And on that panel, we've got Dr. John McSharry, who is the Deputy Director of Graduate Entry Medicine at University College Cork. We have Dr. Garodo Sulawan, who is the Head of Department of Technology Enhanced Learning at Cork Institute of Technology. And Dr. M. O'Brien, who is an Academic Developer for Technology Enhanced Learning at Mary Immaculate College in Limerick. You're all very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to do the, the quick 30 second um, uh, lift version of what you do, if that's okay. I'm going to begin with you, Emma, first of all. Tell us a little bit about what your role is and what you do. Um, hi, John, how are you? So my role involves um, teaching on initial teacher education programs in the area of digital education. So preparing student teachers uh, for using digital technologies in their teaching and also supporting staff in higher education to integrate digital technologies into their teaching. I really hope you've been going around. I told, I told you we should have told them how to use the technology. I'm hoping that you were using that in the last while to completely justify everything that's going on. Uh, John, if I could turn to you, tell us a little bit about your role at GCC. Okay, hi. Thanks very much. So um, my role is I'm the Deputy Director of the Graduate Entry Medicine Programme. So what we do is we have students from European Union and also a lot of international students coming to study medicine. Um, I lecture in medical microbiology, but I also then recruit a lot of the students and we try and implement some learning technologies obviously at the moment it's a uh, fairly challenging with the COVID scenario but um, so we do a lot of uh, I suppose the, the learning technology background platforms and a lot of interactive um, sim uh, simulations especially with medical students there as David was showing us earlier you know you need a lot of uh, hands-on practice to get the skills through. Well you'd like your doctor to have at least tried it a few times before he puts his hands on you. Uh -huh, um, yeah. Okay Garoid tell us a little bit about yourselves in CIT and what you do. Sorry, I just lost you there for a moment. So, Garuda. That's all right. I'm still here. I haven't gone anywhere. Yes, thank you. 
Um, so head of the Department of Technology and Enhanced Learning in the Cork uh, Institute of Technology, soon to be the uh, Munster Technological University, by the way, we're uh, merging with, uh, with our colleagues in IT uh, Tralee. Um, so I've been working in the area for nearly uh, 25 years now, despite my uh, youthful appearance. <laughs> and uh, I've seen a lot of things uh, come and go over that time, I suppose. Uh, I can remember, um, you know, early days of CD-ROM based uh, computer uh, assisted learning and, uh, and the, the original rollout of learning management systems. Uh, like everyone else, I suppose, we have found ourselves uh, moved somewhat from the periphery to the main stage, let's say, in helping uh, CIT uh, respond to the pandemic and the uh, challenges of, uh, of remote teaching. Okay, brilliant stuff. I remember Encarta. You've just brought me back to Encarta. What a, everybody remembers how great that used to be. Uh, and now we've got Wikipedia, which contains too much information and half it isn't true. Um, Emma, I'm going to begin with you because uh, I want to talk about, the, let, let's start with those primary teachers. Um, I have a complete newfound respect for primary teachers because uh, until such time as my children couldn't go to school, I never realised how hard it was to educate the little so-and-sos. <laughs> but that said, um, there was a huge rush to, to embrace technology, but the problem was there was no universal solution. Some schools used this, some schools used that. Others had just adopted technology that was only rolling out. I mean, there was a big, steep learning curve at the start of this, and I'd imagine you were getting a lot of phone calls, were you? Yeah, so um, primary school teachers are in a unique situation. Uh, third level institutes would have a lot of ICT infrastructure that they would have invested over the years, whereas primary school, there hasn't been a massive um, investment in ICT infrastructure. So you're dealing with uh, schools with different levels of ICT infrastructure, different digital skills. Um, as we, as Ashing referred to, there's um, things like digital poverty and inequalities. Uh, schools do more than just support learning. They support the well-being of children and, um, you know, this the socialization of children and primary school children um, their their digital skills can vary so you can't give a, a four-year-old uh, or a five-year-old a computer and expect them to be able to um, be able to, to, to use it to learn uh, and use a piece of software whereas the older kids might be able to do that so you're dealing with varying uh, degrees so there's a lot of factors that can come into play um, you know with that what what are the biggest challenges proved to be that old classic in this country connectivity because whatever about schools having decent broadband not every teacher in every house is going to have good broadband and and, and that kind of came to the fore as well because there were some limitations on what could be done virtually if teachers couldn't post online or couldn't stream videos or even uploading a simple video it took about four hours for some of them i mean there was a lot of different problems yes we're we, we are more advanced than we were five years ago but we highlighted the issues that came up and then they were fairly broad yeah so um i suppose in mary mackle college the stance we take is that um students uh, student teachers need a wide variety of skills and digital skills are becoming more and more important and um, a lot of the, the students come into us and they've used digital technologies for social purposes so they're great at communicating with their peers and they're great at you know um, editing videos and pictures but for for professional um, purposes they they haven't used technology for professional learning purposes and it's re relatively new um, so we have to take the critical stance where in addition to teaching them the digital skills which will be become obsolete fairly, very quickly, um, how to evaluate new technologies in the context of all the different factors that can come into play within a primary school classroom. Um, so, um, and, and we find that, like we saw the fantastic technologies um, that David uh, showcased and, you know, as Garold said, we went from CD-ROMs now to immersive learning environments, but we've been very slow to catch up and it's not often about the technology is, is way ahead of us. It's how we integrate the technology um, in a way that, that considers all the contextual factors. Um, so generally, we have to consider all of those elements as well in order to catch up. Yeah, so in other words, we're not learning about the technology, we're learning about the application of that technology, really, aren't we? And that, that's key. The polls are popping up, by the way. If you see a poll, do please vote on it and you can check the results uh, using uh, the little box at the bottom. Garao de Sulawan, if I can come to you next. Um, CIT, as you talk, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a technical institution, as they used to be called. You're, you're, you're becoming a university, but you've been at the cutting edge of this always, uh, and your department has been there as well. The, the pace at which this is evolving, is it hard for 
education institutions that are traditionally fairly slow moving creatures to adopt the technology in a way that's meaningful in the current time. You know, I think it's hugely challenging. Emma uh, really um, covered the sort of range of things that we have to be aware of uh, so well there. It's sometimes said that teachers are dual professionals. You know, we have to be uh, subject matter experts, but also uh, pedagogical experts. And now it seems there's a third profession we have to become, uh, or they have to become uh, e-learning designers and, uh, and developers as well. And it's such um, a fast paced uh, area. I mean, that's why I find it uh, uh, so fascinating, but I suppose that's what also makes it challenging uh, for the uninitiated. So there's always a next big thing uh, coming along. Uh, obviously, we've been hearing about uh, virtual reality, but there's also tons of other stuff coming down the line in terms of game-based learning, open educational resources, the impact of uh, AI, which we heard a little bit about, uh, about earlier. So it's extremely challenging, and it's very challenging for EdTech managers as well. Uh, there's a requirement, I think, to, to narrow the field almost, to make a strategic selection of, of tools and present those in as uh, clear a way as, uh, as possible um, to, yeah, yeah. to teaching staff and support them uh, in, in uh, every one way. One of the that challenges that, yeah, but I mean, you mentioned teaching staff and that's, that, that's the point I want to raise. Like I'm, I'm friends with a lot of people who are lecturers in, in both the Cork institutions that, that are represented here. Um, yeah. and, and they are constantly talking about their relationship with their students, their ability to talk to students, their ability to engage with those students on a one-to-one on -on -one level. It's the same for Emma's primary school teachers. Education is individual um, and you have to form that connection. If you've got a thousand people looking at a virtual lecturer, all okay, it's fair enough, it's grand, there's lots of exciting things and you're doing things that uh, are, are literally that stuff of science fiction, but are you losing that, that really important element, which is the person that you can go to with your problem who can solve it. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. And it's, um, it's vital, really, I suppose, that people don't think of e-learning or remote teaching as being about, you know, posting some content up online or doing some kind of a Zoom-based uh, based broadcast. It's got to be uh, interactive. We did a big survey of our uh, staff and students back in June to see how they got on. And staff and students, two different surveys, identified communication as having been uh, the greatest challenge. Now, it's not that the technology can't um, support it, but I think maybe sometimes in the rush, you know, to come up with a minimum viable product, as it were, we forget that bit. And it's, it's such a pity. Like, we've been running completely online courses for several years now, and a very big component of it is the online community. And the solution to creating a, a vibrant online community doesn't have to be high tech or, or media rich. It's about doing the kind of things that you do in the face to face classroom. But, you know, I guess it happens a little bit less organically, but getting people to talk to each other and, and helping people to arrive at that mutual support system that is so important in terms of peer learning and um, collaborative learning and even just developing those friendships that are going to carry you through your your educational journey and even yeah, yeah. and it's a, it, yeah it's hard to do that when you're in a room on your own as we were talking earlier on Garod, if i can if i can turn to you uh, and keep the questions coming into us by the way the q a is at the bottom of the screen Garod, for, for medicine in particular i've never studied medicine but uh, i've been in those lecture theaters uh, and you know the idea that you're you're cutting up a corpse at the bottom of the room and everybody's in a shared kind of gooey experience um is there a risk that vr could make that too clinical um, and, and that the, the doctor that you want is the one who isn't afraid of the goo, uh, pardon my language, uh, but uh, is able to do the theory but not the practice. So yeah, so John, I suppose, yeah, like you, you need to have the hands-on, you know, learning, like, you know, where humans are designed to be tactile learners, you know, and interact one is to one for thousands of years. You know, we might, you know, IT will help us, but we have to have that tactile learning. So. We do a lot of 3D printing of models for anatomy um, so that people can have an idea of the structuring of, you know, the connective tissues or the neurons. Uh, so it's very, you know, it's very useful, but you can't really beat the hands-on experience in the lab. And it's the same with, it's like driving a car, you know, 
it's very easy to do a VR driving a car and you can be Ayrton Senna, but in reality, when you go on to, go on to the main road, it's a completely different story, you know? And, um, and yeah, well, condi conditions will be different, as they always will be. <laughs> yeah, but it's blending the two so that they, they complement each other. And as Garod said, it is about kind of getting that community where people interact. Like we have team sessions with the students now, so our guys are back since two weeks ago, and we have team sessions just meeting up and talking about cases. The first few are always really difficult because everyone's very conscious about being on teams and Zoom is great, MS Teams is much slower bandwidth, so it's very hard to have a more interactive discussion. So it's getting used to that and creating that community, but you know, one is to one, you can't beat also, you know. I suppose the, the other side of it is the opportunity that it opens up. Look, one of the big challenges facing Irish educational institutions and your own included is the fact that this year foreign students is a valuable source of income given the way that we don't fund third level to the right way at the moment. All of that has been cut off because those students can't travel to Cork. They can't go to your university. Uh, in future, is there a way in which you perhaps could have medical students who are learning at UCC but living in another country. Is that opportunity potentially being opened up by this type of tech? Yeah, I think so. Like at the moment we were, were quite lucky this year because we made a lot of efforts in March and April and May. And we actually have all our international students here. Uh, they came a month ago and isolated and they're all here and studying. And what we've done is we're doing a combination of, um, I suppose, digital learning, but also hands-on clinical learning. And I, you know, something like what David was showing us earlier, you know, and the VR would really complement where you could do long dis long term distance because you may also have people who may get COVID and have symptoms that might be self isolating. They may not be able to travel. They might go home for Christmas, or you know, and um, so for them to lose out on some of the hands on sessions, you know, it's kind of unfair. So to have a VR system where you could use the hands on and show them, and then they could complement it by doing it in person when they you know to catch up, I think it really would change the world of medicine and. You know, I think all education, we're going to have to blend it so that people can't lose out because they're not there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the track tomorrow is on the future of work, and that is inevitably going to talk about how what we're doing right now isn't permanent. What we will end up with is a hybrid between the two. Um, Emma, if I can ask you about, uh, I suppose, consumer expectation. Um, you know, the old Henry Ford line about if you asked a man, uh, back in the early part of the last century, uh, what would he like? He would say, I'd like a faster horse. He wouldn't necessarily think of the car. But is VR the car? Or is the car the idea that technology can be used to enhance the classroom learning rather than replace it? Um, I think we need to look at... I think what, what the problem has been so far is we're trying to replicate the classroom environment, face-to-face -face environment and an online environment. And we do need to nearly scrap the horse and <laughs> start looking at new ways of doing it. I think VR has its place, but again, it depends on the contextual factors. So, um, you know, if, if for, for things like John was talking about, uh, practical skills, VR has a fantastic place. But for delivering content um, and connect, creating connections between learners, I think, as Garoud said, there's better ways of doing that and putting more time into the process and the human element and the communication. Um, so I think everything has its place, um, but we do need to think creatively about, um, you know, transforming education as such. It, 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 it's new, like what we're going to be doing. Yeah. And by volume, right, by volume, there's a lot more primary teachers than there are third level educators, right? So the, there will be an age gap between the youngest and the oldest. There will be a significant gap between the technological abilities of those. What you'd hate to have is someone goes into second class and has an amazing experience of using technology. And then the third class teacher is two years away from retirement and, and barely uses the interactive whiteboard. So how do we standardize it? You make it uniform. Is, is, is that a, a state level intervention? Is it, is it a global intervention or is it technology led as opposed to being led by the Department of Education, which it would have been to date? Um, I know the Department of Education has a digital strategy, so I think that needs to be um, made more mainstream. There needs to be a massive investment. In, if people don't have access to digital technologies, they, they, needs to, they can't use them. 
So you'll find schools don't have, as you said, a Google Classroom or they don't have um, a, an ICT infrastructure. They share iPads between the school. So there be, needs to be basic in, investment at that level and a basic investment at digital uh, skills level and reward teachers for innovating because teachers are in the classroom, um, you know, and they find it difficult as Garo said, there's so much going on. How do you give them the time to use that? So um, reward like things like innovation and creative use of digital technologies within the classroom. And we're not that far away, Garoid. In fact, I think as far as I remember the last time I was in a lecture theatre in CIT, you still had the overhead projectors. Now, they were slightly fancier than the old film ones that would have been there uh, when I was in college. But uh, the, the technology in educational institutions probably needs significant investment. Um, and at a time when everything else is, is struggling for funding, it's probably one of those things on the long finger, isn't it? And if we don't have the tech, we can't do it. Yeah, I th you know, I think it's, it's slightly different at higher education than perhaps it is at primary and, uh, and secondary school. And this was touched on earlier by, by yourself, I think, Jonathan. Um, we would already have quite a rich e-learning infrastructure in CIT, and that would be similar to other higher education institutes uh, across the country. So at the, uh, at the heart of our systems, we have a learning management system or a virtual uh, learning environment which has been in use for a great many years as a complement, I suppose, to face-to-face -face delivery. So the challenge became, in a way, how to move people away and move people on in terms of their skills from using a learning management system as a nice kind of complement to, to the traditional stuff to using it as an alternative, to, to using it for students who were, um, you know, completely online and, uh, and working uh, remotely. I think the, the, the funding requirement, if I'm to think of it for higher education, is perhaps to give people more time to develop resources and develop their skills. The, the technology per se is, is largely in place already. We have our learning management systems, we have our live e-learning systems like Zoom and Webex and Blackboard Collaborator, what have you, and a host of other uh, components that uh, people like me typically uh, would join together, I suppose, into that into that infrastructure. The other investment piece, though, um, as we, we've touched on, relates to this whole issue of the digital divide. Uh, so we did a survey of, uh, of students uh, back in June, as I was saying, it turns out 15% of them would characterize their internet uh, connectivity as being uh, poor or unreliable, and 35% of them have indicated that they don't have dedicated workspaces to, uh, to study from. So if somebody is uh, thinking about how to best use um, the, um, all of that spare cash the, exec uh, the, the exchequer has, uh, then perhaps that's the way to direct it, uh, I would be saying. Yeah, and, and, and that's usually important. I mean, we, we, the National Broadband Plan, let's not go there because uh, every time I mention it, I, I just imagine my Neostar colleague Jess Kelly shuddering somewhere because every time she talks about it, it brings her out in a cold sweat. Uh, it's good, though, in one way, because my children are sharing the same kind of experience I had years ago. If you had dial-up internet, someone picked up the phone, you lost your connection. Now, because of contention using the link that I have, uh, if I'm on a Zoom call in the evening time, they have to come off YouTube or Fortnite. It causes chaos, and I'm absolutely loving it. Uh, but John, uh, that, that connectivity issue is, is a big one, but it also gives rise to the possibility that not everybody is going to be in lecture theatres going forward. Some might be uh, down in, in, in Dingle. Some might be up in, in Bondoran. Uh, they come occasionally to UCC, but they don't come all the time. Um, is that a potential, uh, do you think? It's the same kind of debate they're having about office blocks. Oh, well, we won't need all these office blocks in future because people are going to be working remotely. Is education going to evolve to embrace that or would that be a negative thing? Um, I think it's going to be a combination, Jonathan. Um, you know, the connectivity is a big issue. You know, we've had bioinformatics students who, by the nature of the, uh, their projects, need good IT and server access completely compromised because of lockdown and it's the same with doing exams you know where you need to have good connectivity if you're doing an online exam so for students to be remote and come for exams you know which we all unfortunately have to give the students exams but for those exams to be remote it's going to be a completely different scenario because you're going to have to try and lock down their computer lock down other devices so you're going to have you know remote proctoring so a lot of these things have to be considered so it might be easier. Remote for us proctoring to sounds very painful. Board. What's that? Hmm? 
What's remote proctoring? It sounds very painful. <laughs> it, it does sound very painful, yeah. Uh, basically, what it is is that, um, you know, someone logs into an exam on one of the learning technology sites, such as um, Canvas Blackboard, or we use it in called Speedwell. They, you can lock down their browser, so you can only use one program at a time. But you, to, to monitor the then you have to engage their webcam to see if they've got anyone helping them or have another device or textbooks next to them. So mm. it's like going, it's like an invigilator in exam hall. And um, so it's, it's going to be a big challenge because, you know, all you need is another device off site of your camera and you can be looking up everything. So it's an open book exam. You know. Well, look, I, I have a big telly here telling me what to say. So let's face it, it it's, <laughs> it's, it's not unknown. And that brings me to the human factor. And the human factor is the thing that has scuppered everything good in humanity uh, from the get-go. Uh, the first fellow who invented the wheel also had a fellow who invented a knife to puncture it. So therefore, the human factor of this is huge. So how do you deal with that, John? How do you deal with the idea that your people will use the technology to bluff their way in and to convince everybody that yes, they are capable and oh yeah, they're a, they're a first-class honor student and then they get next to a patient and they haven't a clue what to do with them. Yeah, well, like it, it's something we joked about, you know, at the start of lockdown saying, oh, this will be the COVID generation where you find out when you graduate and you'll say, I'll have a second opinion from another doctor, please, you know, so, but, um, so yeah, we're going to, it's, that's why you, you need to have, you know, these hands-on and one-to-one -one training and, you know, and David's um, VR, you know, could maybe fill that gap because you can actually monitor how someone is behaving. Um, but, you know, you're going to still need to go in to have a simulated clinics or simulated exam scenarios so that you can check someone's performance. You know, unfortunately, people will cheat, you know. Yeah, and they will. I mean, that there is technology, and I think, Gerard, you, you, you use this, um, which would have been a killer in my day, plagiarism detection, so that you can actually use a type of software that can work out whether somebody's just copied and pasted either someone else's work or straight from the book. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's correct. Maybe at the outset, though, I, I might just say one quick thing about cheating and, and collusion, because we've used uh, these uh, painful sounding uh, online proctoring systems as well, and they, they are painful. I, I, I'm still <laughs> flinching every time you say it. Please stop saying it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they're quite controversial, um, and, and as are the, the use of these, uh, of these plagiarism detection tools. I sometimes feel it's a bit of a misdiagnosis when we get very concerned about students cheating and, uh, and colluding and that we, what we should actually uh, worry more about perhaps is the validity of our assessment approaches. So instead of having high stakes uh, final exams in sweaty sports halls, uh, perhaps uh, you know, we should move towards continuous assessment and projects and presentations and uh, portfolios which would have much better validity uh, to the very thing that we're trying to, to test for because a uh, closed book exam uh, by its nature uh, I think will tend to focus on uh, rote memorization and, uh, and replicative knowledge. But in terms of the plagiarism thing you're asking for, yes th those systems have been around for, for some time. What they typically do is they compare what has been submitted with a range of other sources, things on the public web, things from subscription uh, sources and uh, and uh, things significantly that other students would have uh, would have submitted, but it's a bit of an arms race, really. I suppose the uh, the students are, are finding more and more sophisticated ways to uh, beat the system, and of course there are such a thing as essay mills. So you can purchase essays online, or you can go to some kind of auction house and say, "Look, I have an essay I need to get written for Monday morning on such and such." Uh, you know, who, who'll do it for me? Well, I'll do it. I've got a PhD and whatever. I'll uh, I'll do it for you for 20 quid or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, so you know, you're never underselling for 20 quid. I mean, that's not a good, that's not a good business model at all. You need to up the price. They're under pressure. They need it done for Monday. Make I'll it 50. Um, but, yeah, but the, the challenge is that, that that is always the human factor. And, and one of the other things, Mary, that I, I, I am a bigger pardon, that I was thinking about was uh, in the VR classroom that you know you can you can see if people's heads are going down how can you tell whether someone is paying attention either in a vr setting even on a zoom call oh i have to turn my camera off because uh, i don't know i'm in the underpants how do you know that they're paying attention and they're they're learning because if they're in a classroom you can see them uh, 30 years ago you got a duster thrown at you if you fell asleep <laughs> now you have to make sure that 
they are tuned in and paying attention because if you want continuous assessment you have to be able to eyeball the student and know that yeah they were paying attention um, yeah, I suppose the traditional model is based on seat time and hours and attendance and just because someone is sitting in a lecture doesn't always mean that they're paying attention. And then when you're going into the, the online environment, you're actually going into people's homes and houses and people's different circumstances. And um, similar to what Carol said. Bookcase Envy, we're all looking at the bookcases. <laughs> You've a very good bookcase there, by the way. Um, I picked the best room in the house. My husband's gone out. To the other room. <laughs> uh, poor, oh, John has John uh, has Tom Crean looking over his shoulder and poor Al Garot has a blank wall. You're in this one easy <laughs> but um yeah so you're going into people's homes so there is a whole um piece of research about you know should you make people turn on their cameras we spoke about inequality and digital poverty and um like when you're going to people's homes you're it's not a consistent learning environment even with exams it's it, you're in a precarious environment where there's different factors that come into play um so um as, uh, it's more about the, the, the engagement and, you know, um, where we can, tr where we're transmitting content, maybe, um, you know, re pre-record that and use the online environment to, for discussion and more active learning. Um, so we use the technology wisely to enhance the learning and, and bring people into the learning environment rather than, um, you know, checking our people listening um, and, and things like that. I want to ask each of you the same question if I can. Uh, and that question is based on, of the technology we have right now, we're talking a lot about future tech, but of the technology we have right now, what has proven to be the most beneficial during this period where uh, we were faced with massive disruption and a complete upending of what we do normally? Um, John, for you, what has worked best and what can you see yourself using more, certainly in the next 12 months? Uh, well, I think with Zoom, probably has been much easier for us to use, even though in UCC we're not allowed, we're supposed to use Microsoft Teams, but we've all gone ahead and do it because it's much easier just to talk. Um, the learning technologies such as Canvas, they're all, you know, Blackboard, they're a part of the college and they're quite useful. But um, I think it's talking to the students and trying to interact fairly fast is probably the best thing. Um, actually, there's a lot of students watching this right now. So use the Q&A. Tell us what you've used that works really well as well. So feel free to put questions in. They're coming in and we'll get to them in just a minute. And don't forget the hashtag is TechCork20. Garod, for you, uh, what has been the most useful thing that you've had in the last couple of months? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Zoom and not to rub John's nose in it, but we're, we're allowed to use uh, Zoom in, uh, in CIT and we're, we're rolling it out to staff this week. Uh, I'd maybe give a more boring answer though and say that at the heart of it all really is the learning management system. Um, these systems have been around since the 90s and it's fair to say that they probably fuel the rise of uh, e-learning in, in higher education. Uh, uh, some people have been speaking about their imminent debt or their unbundling, but they've survived and they've thrived because they're very useful. In, uh, in Irish higher education, there's a whole range of different ones in use, Blackboard, Brightspace, Canvas and, uh, and Moodle, and um, they provide ways to uh, integrate other systems with them. So you were talking there about plagiarism tools, that's typically integrated into them, e-portfolio tools if they exist, live e-learning tools like Zoom or Adobe Connect or WebEx or what have you lecture capture system, etc. So it ends up being the, being the hub. And in that sense, while it's a bit of a kind of vanilla kind of answer, it probably is the most. Well, no, but hang on, that goes to my point earlier. That goes to the point that that is user led. And the reason why we all dislike Microsoft Teams and let's not even talk about Google Meet, the reason we come to Zoom is because Zoom's functionality has meant that we all like, I mean, we are here conversing now as if we're all in the one room. So that means that the, it might be vanilla, but hey, it's tried and trusted and we shouldn't throw out the tried and trusted just because somebody puts a shiny box somewhere else. Big, big, big time. And that's what I was saying earlier about the need to make a strategic selection. You know, there's always the next new bright thing coming around the corner. And, and by the way, it's rarely the sense of, you know, has it landed yet or not? the future is here it's just sort of unequally uh, distributed if you like so there's a lot of, of interesting things we could have reached for but we had to be quite strict with ourselves and say well look okay it's really just going to be learning management system uh, live um, live e-learning and in our case the other one we went for was screencasting which was just a way of recording what's on your what's on your screen even though i'm okay. mapping it out and there was about 50 odd options but, but that's that's the trick and it's just as you're saying Jonathan go with what's tried and tested go with what uh, has a 
you know, the lowest learning curve and, and go with what people are already comfortable with. Okay, let's go to you uh, finally on this one, Emma. What technology have you learned most from and are more likely to use more in the future? I think, as Geroad said, the learning management system, it provides a consistent environment for staff and students. Um, so, like, students have a lot to contend with, with, um, you know, their subject specific skills, how to collaborate online without having to use a wide variety of tools. And one lecturer uses one piece of technology and another uses another piece of technology. So, the, the virtual learning environment or the learning management system does provide that consistency and, um, you know, as Geroad said, ease of use. and, and and it does provide all the functionality people need. Uh, before we go to the uh, questions from people who are watching right now, I want to talk about the, the, the state and what the government can do. We have a new minister uh, for higher education. Uh, it seems that you know, somebody in government buildings has, has finally decided that this is actually worth investing in, uh, despite you know, the obvious benefits of it. And technology is one of the things that Simon Harris is going to have to address with the HEA moving forward. The last thing you want is somebody popping up saying, I'm from the government and I'm here to help because more than likely they'll force a solution onto you that isn't the right one. So uh, if you had the ear of Simon Harris um, at a social distance, what would you tell him, John? Um, well, I think it, Simon's track record, in fairness to him, he did see a good enough job at the HSE when he was there. So um, I wouldn't kill him straight away. It made away, him go uh, very grey, very young, though. It's, it's probably yeah, not the best example. Not love him, but um, no, what I, I think what we, you know, it's like the HSE, the Irish education system needs massive investment. Um, you know, we're all, you know, we all have big issues with the NFET and HSE and all the messages coming out. But, you know, you have to look historically, they've all been underinvested. And the Irish education system from the primary the whole way up to the third level is massively underinvested. And if you want to compete with, you know, guys like Stanford, who David was talking to, you know, you're going to have to invest. And it's as simple as that. Um, so you need IT, you need facilities, and it's just they're going to have to find a way to do it. You know, if Apple come in and say, yeah, we don't and have that, that really almost prioritise that above other things, I would imagine as well. Garroyd, what would you say to him? Yeah, I, I kind of um, gave a similar answer um, earlier, but, you know, maybe to, to offer something a little bit different, I think we need models for how it's all going to work. There's probably an industrial relations piece in terms of the weightings and allowances for online and particularly in the Institute of Technology sector. We need to work out what the equivalent is in terms of contact hours. So contracts for staff in the Institutes of Technology is based around uh, contact time with, uh, with students. If that continues to be the case, then probably people will just transfer over all their timetabled classes to Zoom sessions, which might not be the most pedagogical. Well, hang on a second. Uh, 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 on, on that point, um, this transition has resulted in a lot more work. And while people may have absorbed that because of the crisis, it's probably unsustainable going forward. I remember talking to a lecturer about this during exam time um, uh, as we were heading into the summer. And he was telling me he's never worked more hours. Uh, above and beyond what he was contracted to pay, and like you know, we can all go on about uh, hours and everything like that. But is that sustainable um, in the current way, or do we? Is that probably one of the key things we have to look at? Yeah. So, th so that's exactly the point I was making. It's not sustainable. There was the sense for a long time that we were all uh, in it together. Uh, I, I think in all kinds of different ways, people are beginning to wonder if everybody else is really in it. Uh, together with them in the same way as they had uh, originally thought. Look, it's not, uh, it's not a sustainable uh, model the way things are getting done uh, at the moment. And it would be a terrible pity, um, those of us in the ed tech community worry about this, if we came out the other side and everybody went, well, that was awful, let's never do it again. <laughs> you know, this is a wonderful opportunity to, you know, carry stuff forward uh, in terms of, you know, a, a changed repertoire, let's say, of skills that, uh, that that teaching staff would have. But the other point, sorry about investment, is research and development. You know, so it's not all about practice. There has to be that virtuous uh, circle, if you like. So we have to keep investigating the new stuff that's coming along, figuring out new pedagogical models in order to ensure the currency of our provision and future-proof things. And the virtuous circle comes about because if you think about all that's happening right now, what a wonderful opportunity to feed in all of that end user insight and bring uh, wonderful realism to the kind of exploratory research 
that those of us who are involved in research in the area are carrying out. So that would be my other ask in terms of uh, funding okay. uh, the area. Very good. And uh, last word on this to you, Mary, if you can. If you had Simon Harris uh, in the office with you now, what would you ask him for? Um, I think... Uh, Emma, sorry, why do you keep saying Mary? It's talking about Emma, I beg your pardon. I might look like Mary. <laughs> um, <laughs> Very eye, that's where I'm getting confused, Very sorry. Eye. <laughs> um, I think, uh, as Geralt said, um, blended and online education isn't cheaper. Um, we need to level the playing field. So there's a lot of disparity in terms of the student skills level, the student access to technology, um, and the, 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 the staff skills level, how it's, it, it's integrated. So I think we need to level the playing field and bring everybody up to some sort of a, 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 a baseline um, so we can uh, advance it further. Okay, let's go to some of the questions that have come in. And the first one is from Saeed. He says, hello there. Uh, is the VR education accredited by government yet? I don't think it is. is the, 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 does government even know it exists? Does anybody know the answer? Uh, no. So we'll have to assume that there is absolutely no acknowledgement in government yet that anything is accredited by it. Uh, another attendee says, what countries are leading in edtech and how quickly can we catch up? John, where are you looking to as, as exemplars here? Yeah, we're look at Singapore. Um, we were over in Singapore last year with uh, we have a lot of medical students and collaborations, but they had all these 3D printing virtual classrooms, you know, big circular classrooms, continuous assessments, as Garod said, you know, for all their exams rather than large summative assessments, so that the people are engaged all the way through. So Singapore would be good, or Stanford are always world leaders as well. Okay, very good. Um, uh, one here says, um, uh, this is from Sean. Good morning, Sean. Emma's point about cameras and homes strikes me as a very big social issue in remote education. It is like school uniforms, instead of bringing your own clothes to school. But what is the uniform to solve it? And, and that's the thing. We are big in uniforms in this country because it just means that some kids don't come in in, in the tracksuits that they wore to training last night and others come in in, in Gucci gear. So Emma, how do we how do we make sure there's a level playing field? And, and I think Garrod mentioned earlier on the idea some schools bought iPads uh, and, and then ultimately that's abandoned the iPads because they were too expensive and they didn't work. So how do we make sure we don't misstep? I think you need to think about why you're doing these things. So why do we need the camera on? You know what I mean? Why? Um, and you need to think about the, 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 the empathise with the student as well. So you need to think about why why do you need the camera on? Why do you, and be conscious of the fact that we're going into people's homes, we're going into people's circumstances and put yourself into the student's use. So we talked about humanising. So I think like digital technology, it's a perception that we remove the human element, but it's us that are human at the end of the day and how we use the technology. So we need to be human and how we use the technology and consider the students and, and the circumstances and why we use them. Okay, folks, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you all today. Thank you so much uh, for all of your insights. Good luck with the new academic year when it's getting underway in a couple of weeks' time. Who knows how it's going to finish up, but at least uh, there is a willingness to embrace technology um, that's being led by all of you. So thank you so much for joining us here uh, at IT at Cork today uh, for Tech Cork 20. Dr. Emma O'Brien, see so I got it right that time, from Mary Immaculate College in Limerick, Dr. Garoda Sulawan from Cork Institute of Technology and Dr. John McSharry. Fingers crossed, lads, we'll all be in the same room next time we're doing this. But now comes the awkward waving part. You all have to awkwardly wave as we turn off our cameras. Thank you very much, folks.